thank you all for joining us. Um, I think we'll have more people probably popping in soon. Are there any adjustments that we need to make to the agenda? Anybody? Okay. Lisa? Yes. Um, I'd like to have a short discussion on the supervisory union audit. Okay. Um, you think that we need to have that um, separate from the business manager's report? I can do it there. Okay. All right. I think that might be a good time. Well, we know we'll have Tara with us at that time, and she already submitted her report. So thank you. Okay. Um, we don't normally assign times or a timekeeper. Um, does anyone feel like that's something we need to or should do at this point in time? Okay. We'll just keep moving forward. Usually we manage to keep things um, pretty focused. So we'll just rely on that instead. Um, public comment. I noticed we do have some members of public joining us this evening. Um, we, we have an opportunity for public comment at the beginning and the end of our meeting. Um, so you can feel free to either share now or um, closer to the end of the meeting if you choose. Um, and please just feel free to unmute. I think I can see everybody in my grid. Um, and if you're calling in by phone, star six to unmute. And please identify yourself by name. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone um, unmute, so I'm going to assume that we'll save public comment for later in the meeting. Um, I have on the agenda a, a consent agenda to approve the minutes of Tuesday, November 17th, which was a regular meeting, and Monday, November 23rd, um, a special meeting. So I would entertain a motion um, to approve those minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. Okay, as written? As written, yes. Sorry. Great, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion of the minutes from November 17th and November 23rd? Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes from November 17th, our regular meeting, or November 23rd, our special meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The minutes are approved. All right. Have a moment of board comment. Um, does anyone from the board like to um, use this opportunity to comment? I'd like to just ask the principals well, and ask the superintendent's office if there's um, reports that can get to us a little earlier than the day of, that'd be helpful. Yeah, that that can be challenging. Um, I mean, I know we get the principal's report and the superintendent's report earlier, and I was able to read those ahead of time. Right. Um, but the ones that come in the day of the meeting, I do feel like I'm not able to do my due diligence because um, they came in while my work day was still happening, and I got home about 15 minutes before this meeting. So it makes it yeah. really hard to make it all fit. But I do understand people are are struggling with, you know, their workload as well. Owen, you wanted to share? I was just going to say, I hope our principal's report gets to you in a timely fashion. And yeah. not, I think I'm saying the same thing as you, Lisa, when I say um, some of the reports are being developed, like, in real time. 
Mm -hmm. So I hear you, Bob, and we, I think that's the place where we could continually improve. Thank you for the feedback. But let's get those reports to the board sooner is what I would say to my colleagues. Mm -hmm. We work, I mean, I work, and, and I'm sure the rest of the board members are working too. So getting a last minute report, not that helpful. Help. Not helpful, yeah. yeah. Respect everybody's time. I think is a good uh, norm. Yep. Thank you. And I do want to say I appreciate we got the bulk of the reports that we needed for this evening five days ago. So right. I do appreciate that. All right. Um, and I do also just want to take a moment while we have an opportunity for board comment. Um, to say how much I appreciate the work that's been going on. Um, in our schools, I've been getting a lot of positive feedback about the work that kids are doing outside. Um, and I just really appreciate that because I know it's a really challenging year to be working in a school. There's so many conflicting messages in our society um, about where it's safe to be and where it's not safe to be. And I feel like our schools are really great places that are still pretty vibrant for kids. Um, and focused on safety, and I, I appreciate your work um, in doing all of that. Owen? Yeah, I'm a little chatty tonight. I apologize. Um, I had a coffee on the way home that I left in the car, but I do want to say something about teachers, if it's appropriate at this time. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that, and I know you're a teacher. And... Um, I also know that a lot of folks, I think all of us support education in a big way. And, you know, when I hear the national uh, reference to like, let's try to open our schools, I think we should celebrate that our schools in Vermont and especially in White River Valley Supervisory Union are open and have stayed open and have allowed people to work and kids to have a safe, quiet place to learn and to eat three meals a day and to have snacks. And I think a lot of this goes to the lens at the this leadership in this meeting, which and I'm going to I'm going to nod to Jamie on this because he's gotten some some pushback. I know from the middle school faculty of like, what are we doing? My hair is on fire, but our hair is on fire, but we know how to put it out. But this school board has not been nothing but supportive of us. And uh, I just really feel supported. And I know my teachers do. But at the same time, we're carrying a lot of weight. And thank you. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to just comment on um, um, Jamie's communication with the community has been great. And his communication with the teachers has been great. Um, and that's something I don't think happens in many schools. So I've never seen it. I've never seen it to the point that it's being done right now. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Jamie, you raised your hand. <clears throat> I just said thank you. It might be frozen. <laughs> I was just saying thank you. All right. Move forward. Um, our next segment of the agenda is reports to the board. <clears throat> uh, good evening. So I also just want to piggyback um, the team that you know we have here at WRVSU is amazing, and our teachers and staff and um, all of our educators have been incredibly um, dedicated, committed, and flexible for us in order for us to stay open. So please know um, as a community and all those watching and listening that I can't thank all of you enough. So thank you very, very much for all that you do. Um, it's December 15th and uh, we are literally, I shouldn't say this, but only uh, three days away, folks, and we made it to the holiday break, and uh, we've been in school 
throughout the SU five days a week. And that is unbelievably amazing. And so thank you all very, very much. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a major rebound for our students and have a bunch of celebrations. And oh, by the way, we also built another entire school in the month of August in the VLA that's educating 165 students, K through 12, across the SU with our own educators, our own staff. We're not relying on third party platforms. And we've been able to do that here because folks have been committed and dedicated and doing what's best for kids. So just thank you all very much. Um, it's a huge celebration. How many, how many kids, Jamie? Uh, it fluctuates, but I think at one point, like 165. Yeah, great. Um, and so you have my report in hand. What I want to remind the board is, is that um, tonight in the budget process, I'll kind of set the tone of what you're seeing. Um, and based on the proposal tonight and how we're demonstrating it to you is based on some feedback I've received from board members across the SU about wanting to see budgets around function code you'll get the entire workbook um, next uh, month in addition to um, the revenue side of the budget, which is really important in your tax sheet. I think you should plan now for the possibility of two meetings in January, just so you know, um, and they'll be focused on finalizing the budget. I mean, we may be able to put it to bed in one, but I think you should plan accordingly for two with a special meeting um, after our regularly scheduled meeting. I've been saying that to all the boards, just so you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the things that, you know, right now I'm keeping my, my eye on my pulse, you know, my finger on the pulse of, I'm really concerned with still the shortfall in revenues and the ed fund. Um, you know, that's looking like a result of a increase of about 9% in regards to property taxes before we do anything here locally. Um, the budget you'll see tonight is a little bit under level funding, which is an incredible accomplishment by your administration. Um, to pull that off and you're when you hear it you'll see that it doesn't come at the cost of any programming we were able to keep all the quote programming you have in place plus um, extend some supports uh, k through 12 for kids and so the principals will talk to you about some of that so i'm really proud of the work they've done um, you know we're trying to leverage our consolidated federal grant more um, and I've been talking to you about that since um, September. So that should assist us on the revenue side. Uh, the finance committee knows that um, we're gonna look to budget um, conservatively in regards to tuition students. I'm really concerned, excuse me too, about where tuition students may or may not fall due to COVID. Um, I know, you know, where I was uh, previously that you know they're looking right now that some of their tuitions are down based on my conversation with their business manager and i think covid has made it more difficult to recruit um, and really try to sell our product to students i am working though uh with cynthia powers in the su office to try to really leverage our ability to market and get some momentum for that um, the second half of the year so we have momentum rolling into next school year and so you'll see a plan about that um, very soon um, next month in regards to how we're looking to increase marketing and our efforts in that area. Um, so that those are my reports tonight. Um, and uh, I'll certainly entertain any questions folks have. Jamie, can you tell me again the, the name of the grant? Um, that's the consolidated the CFG, so the Consolidated yeah. Federal Grant. So that's your Title okay. One, Two, Three, and Four. Okay. So when you see your budget, all those folks, all folks that work for you, even if they're funded under the grant, you're gonna see them as expenditures. Next month, you'll see offsetting revenues, which decreases your per pupil spending, right? Because it's a, it's a revenue. And so what we're looking to do is try to figure out how can we leverage as much revenues as possible to your guys' budgets to decrease your per pupil spending, which has a direct impact on your tax rate. <clears throat> Any other questions for Jamie while we have um, this opportunity? Lisa? 
I think you're muted, Lisa. There, unmuted. Um, I did get an email a couple weeks ago from uh, South Royalton uh, town office wondering, you know, about the timing of when we submit our budgets to go into the town reports and and I so I forwarded that on to Lisa, but I think that, you know, it sounds like you're thinking about this, but I think they were wanting our budget information by the middle of January if we wanted to get it into their publication. And so I just was hoping that um, we can start going backwards, uh, you know, figure out our deadlines and move to where we are today for the town of Bethel, the town of Royalton, making sure that, you know, last year it was a scramble and we had to publish our own uh, report. Lee, yeah, Lisa, I have that. Uh, that's going to be part of our discussion on 8.2. Okay, great. Bethel actually needs it by January 8th. And I think that's a wicked push to but well. So I wanted to talk to you guys about that on your Okay, great. So I'll wait till I just wanted to make sure that that was on gonna be discussed. So cool. Great. Other questions? Jamie, if um how are you dealing with the uh uh six hundred thousand dollar loan? We haven't touched it. So that's good. What's the plan? I know. Yeah, good. Well, good. it's a line of credit. So the plan would be that there were, I mean, I, my plan is that we hopefully now we, I think we're going to be such that we'll have an influx of cash always comes in, in December and January, like we talked at the finance committee. And so the idea would be to try to op pay off some of our tax anticipation note um, and not not have to pull down or draw on that line of credit. So that's good news. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking that, Bob. I think that's good to get that out there. I, I just wonder how we're gonna, are you thinking that we'll, that we're gonna cover the deficit in this year's budget? Well, my plan was to spend a majority of our next finance committee meeting um, talking about different proposals about how we may want to do that and then bring those proposals to the board in January um, of whether or not, you know, we want to put it out there for a bond and have an anticipated cost over three years or how we wanted to go about that process. Um, I have it. I, I'll have a, I have some to discuss. I'll do that later. Right, thank you. Um, so that brings us then to the the principal's report. If there's no one else who has a question for Jamie, although I'm sure he's gonna be with us all night. So, Owen, yes, please. Yes, I'd like to kick off the principal's report. Okay. I'm really proud of this week's. We have 16 bulleted points. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them includes the newsletter, which Kate George is uh, helping us facilitate. And I, I'm really proud of it. And it's not a strength of mine, but <clears throat> Kate is really good about like reminding me and all of us about like, you got your deadline here. And it's been really helpful. And being a learner, seeing myself as a learner, I've had to like adjust how I do business, but there's a piece in there about Mindy Wilmette in the newsletter, and she won a statewide recognition as one of the top two math teachers in the state. And those, one of those people will be chosen to be a Vermont representative that will go and be recognized at the national level and regardless if she is chosen or not, I think it's important for folks to look at that and read that and take a minute. And it's not just Mindy Wimette. And I know you know this, Lisa, that, and Bob, I also know you know this as an educator. The first thing that educators do when they're recognized is talk about who is behind them. And it's not behind them. The people that have they're standing on their shoulders. And 
and I know Mindy will do that, but I encourage everybody on this meeting, in this meeting, and especially the board members to send a card or an email to Mindy because it takes only a minute, but it means so much. I also am really proud of what our um, administrative team is putting out for a newsletter and a report. And I love the structure and that it's again, it's not sucking up to Jamie, but to create a structure where we are, have, are focusing on our three strategic goals and we have 16 points we're making. I'm really proud of it. Anyway, I should probably check my uh, water intake as much as my coffee intake. But thank you, Lisa. <laughs> thank you, Owen. I agree. It was a great looking um, newsletter and lots of good information, very positive. So thank you um, for that. Um, other questions um, from board members or are there other portions of the principal's report um, that people would like to highlight? I, I also want the board to know that uh, Lindy's here too, to represent yeah. PLA. Um, and Lindy, do you wanna highlight any parts of your report? Cause I know that one did come in yesterday. Yes, and I apologize for that. We were in the lovely report card uh, realm. I really just have to express my appreciation. So the elementary school uh, teaching staff in the Virtual Learning Academy launched and are the first group of teachers to use a proficiency-based report card in literacy and mathematics. Um, this was very time consuming in a good way, a good practice, a good examination of our practices and definitely eye-opening and they did a great job. So all those report cards, uh, K through eight were mailed out on Friday, um, which was a big uh, task, but a successful one. And I just really, I can't say enough how great the staff was. They really wanted to make sure their feedback was thorough because they knew it was something new for parents to be looking at as well. So they did a great job making sure there was really thorough comments about the reasoning and the progress they're seeing and what they're looking forward to working on this trimester. Um, so I wanted to highlight that because there was a lot of time that went into that outside of their teaching day. Um, the other just kind of quick updates that are going on as we started the second trimester is um, we have implemented, you know, live music and library lessons or classes for um, K through five, uh, K through eight does, or sorry, excuse me, six through eight does receive live art and um, they have access to PE, it's like a choice word. And then um, they receive activities K through five for art class every week that they can do independently. So it's not on a screen, screen time. We're trying to be mindful of kids screen time and encourage some creativity outside of the classroom space. Um, we have one group that's gonna try a virtual field trip and see how that goes at the Billings Farm. And I'll be interested to hear. And then I'm trying to think what else, in six, seven, eight, for the second trimester, we've started an inquiry-based learning project. And this trimester, it'll be focused on science specifically. And then next trimester, we'll do one on social studies. So those are kind of the highlights. Thank you. I'm curious about your virtual field trip. I'm kind of... I know. I was hoping I could rearrange my day to join. I just don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. But it, I will be sure to uh, get a little update from Ms. Farrington's class. Thank you. Any other? Reed, I just did you unmute. Great. Yeah, I'd uh, add that uh, as of the end of the day, Friday, the last of the South Royalton um, unit ventilators had been installed. Um, we uh, got into the project and realized that we had six rooms, six classrooms in the building that uh, actually part of the old building weren't getting fresh air. Uh, so we quickly pivoted and went back to Efficiency Vermont and received an additional $19,000, um, which entailed uh, having to bring in masons to drill and cut six holes through the the, um, the brick walls in order to create some openings for these univents. 
So really excited that before we got to the single uh, degree temperatures, we uh, were able to make all that happen without losing any uh, learning time for students. Um, we still have a little bit of wiring to do to hook it all up to the, the main program so we can, can control it all remotely, but uh, that should happen Monday. Thank you. That's a great update. Lindy, I have a question. Um, Absolutely. About MAP. What specifically? <laughs> Anything uh -huh. just in general? I, I mean, we could, um, in terms of math instruction, like what are yeah. kids receiving? Absolutely. Um, so we are some classes specifically in the, I want to make sure I get this right, second, third, fourth, and fifth have been using the iReady program that South Royalton has been piloting. Um, just because it seems a little more technology based and user friendly in that platform. Um, I'm hopeful. So in January, we'll do another round of assessments. They, the virtual learning students will take uh, the Star 360 just like our in person students. So I am excited and curious to see that growth. The other thing I would say that we've switched to in most levels of the virtual learning uh, academy is small group instruction. Um, that you can't do a live math lesson or a lot of other math, a lot of other instructional lessons and make sure that every kid gets it through the screen. All those checks that you do when you're walking around the classroom, you can't do in this um, platform. So they've really started to switch to some smaller groups, whether it's dividing the class in half or whether it's, you know, depending on the age group, three to four kids at a time. And so it um, probably feels a little like Groundhog Day to some of the teachers because they're teaching the same lesson, but it allows them to differentiate and really check for understanding. Some of the older grades, um, Nancy Pageway uses something called EduCreate, which allows her to record the lesson as she's writing. Um, so the kids can see her demoing live. And what they do is they access it together and then stay on and ask questions as they work through the work. And kids can either like jump off work and then jump back onto the link and ask questions. Um, so we still, I would say just like in person, need to make mathematics instruction and our background knowledge just as much of a priority. Um, and I am excited to kind of be able to have some apples to apples data to compare in the month of January, just because we'll have star results from the fall in September and star results in the same venue. You know, kids will have taken them virtually both times. So it'll be in a similar setting to be able to compare a little bit better. Does that answer your question or do you have more questions about math? Oh, I have more, but that's okay. Okay. Other questions for Lindy or other um, areas that our principals would like to highlight? Um, this is just on the principal's report in general. I've made this comment the last couple months where I do appreciate the focus, you know, the report where it has the three sections on our three goals and you give information on that. But I do feel like we need to also have the just general system stuff. So like read your um, thing on the uh, ventilation system. You know, that wouldn't fit into one of those three categories, but if there was like a general purpose category or just like an introduction that's the state of the school or whatever, where you could fit those things that don't fit into those priorities. Like we definitely need the priorities because that makes sure that we're keeping those top of mind and are showing progress in them. But we also need the everything else too, you know? So we need a section where you can put things that aren't those three priorities because, you know, we want to know what's going on and everything else as well. It just we every month we get those three things in addition. So I would say that we we heard you on that. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs> um, and I think that Owen and I went to write the Owen Reed and I went to write the report. And um, I think we probably should talk to Jamie about it too, just because Jamie gave us a direction, and so we um, purposely sure. have been adding the newsletter to try to get some of those other things that happen in the school. Um, but I hear what you're saying about the, the ventilation system too. So we'll make sure to put that on our agenda next time we meet with Jamie to 
Yeah, I mean, if you guys feel like there haven't been other things, then that's fine, I guess. But, you know, just. Yeah, Andrew, I think I can help the principles around the introductory and conclusion. It helps wrap up those, those types of Perfect. Things. It's the denouement that's the problem. Well, for, for what it's worth as a last add-on then before we close the principal's report, uh, we did have two new hires in South Royalton in the last two weeks that we're really excited about. We're, we're back up to full staffing in our custodial group uh, with the hiring of Aaron Green on the Monday after Thanksgiving or his starting work. Um, and uh, we also hired a paraprofessional uh, a week ago to uh, to help out with our special education uh, department. And those were all budgeted for, so the board knows, and vacant yeah. positions that we have been trying to hire since the start of the year. Great, thank you. Okay. So next we come to the business manager's report. Good evening, everybody. My report was submitted to you in the original board packet, which gave just the general updates, but then also that was part of the report was the revenue and expenditure summary report that we presented to the finance committee and they liked it and we would be using this report moving forward for uh, RUD and for the SU and then bringing it on to our other member districts as well. So if you have any questions on the actual report, um, I can answer them. Otherwise, if you'd like to go over the revenue and expenditure report, we can spend some time doing that. I think we should go over it, Tara. Mm -hmm. Do you mean, Bob, go over the expenditure and revenue reports or yeah. go over the okay that's yeah. what i was thinking you meant um yeah. is the the business manager's report seemed pretty straightforward okay thank you so this first page that we're looking at that ray has up on the screen and i'm going to actually look at mine so you'll see my head turning back and forth is uh, the revenue summary and this report was shared with us from jamie's prior business manager this is something that they use over there that seems to work really well and provide the information that you all are looking for in a one to two page format versus the 35 page expenditure summary that you've been getting so this first page is the revenue you'll see over in the beginning there is the fy21 budgeted column and then the FY21 projected column. You can see that we are, what we've received to date and based on what we project through the rest of the fiscal year, we're about $51,000 short on the tuition. Uh, interest income we haven't received, or sorry, we've projected to receive all of that. And then I don't project to receive a lot of the miscellaneous revenue that we had, given the times that you're not doing a lot of the, the extra stuff that was done in the past. Also rentals, you're not renting your facilities to the community at this point, so I don't anticipate getting any rental income for that. And then the same with the student activities, they're pretty limited to what they can do with COVID, so I'm not anticipating getting any additional revenues there. The next section down is the state revenue. This is what you get through property taxes, that first line. We should get everything that we're projected to get, as well as the state tech ed funding and the transportation aid. That's based on your prior year expenditure and then the state produces a percentage that we get. So based on FY20, we'll be, I anticipate us being about $2,500 short on that line item. The next section is special education, and that's no longer in the local budgets. That's done by the SU, so we, that's just removed from there. And then the last section on the, the top part of this report is other revenue and refunds. So you have your vocational transportation reimbursement, and that calculation is based on what I submitted for the first semester. I just doubled that based on what I project that we'll get for the second semester. So about an $18,000 difference there. And then the driver's ed reimbursement, I base that on what we received in FY20, not knowing exactly what will be impacted with COVID for driver's ed. 
And then adult learning, um, that's also all that we received in FY20. So I don't anticipate getting additional revenue there unless there's additional adults that I'm not aware of at this point in time. And the last line there is uh, what we anticipate for the grants. And then it gives you a brief summary of what your uh, FY21 budgeted revenue is and your expenditures, and they have to balance. And then the projected revenue and then the projected expenditure, which is the second page of the report, which we'll go to after this. And then the projected current operating surplus or deficit. And you can see I'm projecting right now, we have about a $4,900 surplus. And then the bottom section is the historical information. So that goes over again what the FY19 audited deficit was, what the projected FY20 non-audited deficit or surplus is. And that number there is the general surplus, def, uh, the general fund surplus that I provided to you all in August, less the food service deficit. So that's the, the difference between those two there. And then you'll see the next section is if we use prior year. Tara, can I just add just for the public that that dollar figure does not include the audited deficit that we projected to you with in August of the SU, because that bill back happens after the audit. Yeah, this is purely just Rudd's general fund. So that 563 will go into a deficit after the audit's received. And then, the, so the next section is- Lisa, wait a minute. Lisa, I see you thinking. You see, do you see what I'm talking about with that 563, Lisa? Yes. FY20 yep. not audited. That we are projecting a 563 surplus for you locally, even after you, your food service deficit. Okay. But that so does not include- Right. That does not include the SU deficit that will be added after the audit. Okay. And I'm also, so since you recognize my puzzled expression, um, I'm also wondering about those building reserve amounts. Um, I just don't remember. I mean, I remember the Bethel building reserve um, because of some of the projects that we've had. I don't remember having nearly $200,000 um, for the Royalton Campus Building Reserve. So those were the reserve balances straight out of your audit after the FY19 okay. audit was completed and confirmed. All right. So you'll notice that 129 has been used. So we don't have that anymore. Right, yeah, yeah, okay, thank no. you. All right. Is the long-term goal to kind of keep these more up to date so that like we can just, rather than saying we've used 129,000 kind of in the note, just keep that amount with what the current balance is, even if it's not the other. Yeah, audited. those will be updated on the 30th of every month, right? So you saw this, Andrew, and then the, the finance committee will get a new one and then that will go to the board. Mm -hmm. I like the format. Terry, you want to walk them through page two? Because, I mean, there is a little bit better news. Write in a note so I don't forget. <laughs> so then the second page is the expenditure side. So again, all the way over to the left, you'll see, or the right, sorry, you'll see that that is your approved FY21 expenditure budget. And then the next section down is items not budgeted for. So as you recall, we didn't budget for your coordinator of student support. So I put that in there. And then the COVID costs, which we are in hopes to get reimbursed for through our CRF funds, but I still wanted to identify that as an unbudgeted cost that you have here. So that's a total of 233,000. And then items- How soon, before, how what was soon that? before that reimbursement comes through, that COVID cost? You know, Jamie? Yeah, Tara and Jason are working with Cynthia to submit that this month. 
And then Tara, what have they said the turnaround time is to actually receive the, the money? I haven't heard anything as far as when they actually issue checks. As far the expenditure, the grant itself for the CRF funds goes through the end of December. So you have until December 30th to use the grant funds that you were awarded for this portion of the CRF funds. And then you submit for your reimbursement to get those funds back. And then the second round of grant funding, which is our ESSER funds, those we will then supplement with what we haven't received in our CRF funds and the continuing expenses through next year. That's what the ESSER funds are for. So that's what I meant by good news. So you saw what we're projecting, but what you need to know is that projected surplus of that, you know, was it 5,000 or 4,000 and change included all these expenses and us not being reimbursed yet. I think that's important for you to know. We didn't add that revenue in yet because we wanted to wait until we knew for certain we had it. So the covert cost, what about that grant? You know, when do, go, when do we get reimbursed for that? That's what we're talking about, Bob. We have until December 30th to spend those funds and then you submit for reimbursement to get those funds back. So we should know early on, I would assume in 2021 from the agency. They that have, we, we've already been granted the, the funds. Yeah, we as it was my business an manager's report, we received as a supervisor union $555,000 in the CRF grant. And we submit for reimbursement through the supervisory union and our member districts for those expenses. And none of the, so because that's a block amount for the entire SU, none of the um, districts have overspent to make it so that we'll be left without reimbursement? Well, Lisa, I mean, what we're gonna be doing is, is then looking if there's areas where we have overspent, prioritizing those for the ESSER grant still. That ESSER okay. grant's still in place. So right. we know that amount. So we have another big chunk of money that we can then use and apply for after January 1. Yeah. Right, yep, thank you. So then the next section down are items overspending or projected to overspend in the budget. There are only two items right now that I'm keeping my eye close on. That the first one is health insurance based on the expenditures that have been paid to date in the monthly cost. And then open enrollment starts and was allowed for in January. So people can change their health insurance plans in January. There may potentially be about a $45,000 overspenditure on the health insurance side. And then the second one is the VISTERS, which is the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System, OPEB, which is the new teacher health assessment. My understanding um, when I worked with the Treasury Department, when I saw the bills come in for this this year, that this is actually an assessment that the district is responsible to pay for the entire time that a new teacher works for you. My understanding was that there was an, a, a mis understanding previously that it was only a one-time fee, but it is in fact an annual fee that you will pay for any teacher who entered the state teacher's retirement system as a new enrollee from 2016 on. So we have the list that was provided for your district this year. There was $32,844 that uh, for the new teachers that you have. So in the budget that you'll see later on this evening, we've also now accounted and budgeted additionally for that. So based on those two, that brings us down to the total projected expenditures with overspending. And then the next section, this is uh, what your administrative team, Jamie and I worked on as to areas in the budget where we think that there is savings in the current fiscal year based on what's not being done or what's not being spent. So you can see that they've got field trips and transportation, mentor stipends, salary for staff that hadn't been replaced, supplies and books, and then building and maintenance contracted services for a total projected savings of $411,990. 
So that brings the net projected expense down to that 11,996,973. So that's where we come up with that projected surplus in the expenditure side of the budget of 101,146, which offsets the shortfall in the revenue side. Jamie, does that include? In it, is it included the, the uh, SU assessment included in this? No, this is purely based on your budget. So the SU assessment that you budgeted for, that is what's in here now. Well, is it reflected in the statement? Yeah, it's reflected as as budgeted. So, you know, that could get better. Mm -hmm. um, and you are gonna look at the SU, this same uh, type of template at the next SU board meeting next week. Well, okay, we own 40% of it or something like that. Is that reflected in this? Yes, but as actual budget. Not right, at what but but going forward, once we get that SU report that does the same thing, it would make sense to have a line in here that, you know, if there is a surplus or a deficit to have a line in here so that that gets reflected in this budget and we don't have to, you know, remember what we had in the other meeting. Well, that's how this will continue to get updated every month, right? right? Exactly. Otherwise, it would just look the same. I appreciate this. I think it's a lot more user friendly. Um, I appreciate it being just a really succinct report. And I think with with that um, information included, um, it'll be really, really useful. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. This is great. I feel like I have one place to go to get like a lot of the information I need and just knowing that you have, you know, the 38 page workbook <laughs> or whatever you referred to it as if I had a question, I know where to go to get that information. But this um, gives me information that I feel like, you know, it's like an at a glance, how are we doing and I really appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I found it as an excellent tool when I was creating it for your information. I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to have it and to use it moving forward. Right, and with your board background, I bet you can really see the utility of it for us. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I remember, Bob, that you had some additional questions. Um, Tara, I don't know if you have more that you wanna share with us. Um, otherwise, I know that Bob had some questions. Um, So, well, go in either direction. I just I want the board to take a look at the uh, SU um, 2019 audit and um, the actual deficit was eight hundred and thirty thousand for the SU, and uh, Jamie reduced it. I think you reduced it to 560,000. Jamie? Yeah, that's what we were projecting in August. Yep. Okay. So you, you started out with under 830 and you reduced it to 560. Are you talking about over the last two years, Bob? I'm just talking about the 2019 audit. And you said the SU audit. That all gets assessed out every year, so they start basically at zero every we year. We start clean, right. And the audit that's currently happening for 1920, you know, we, that audit, they've gotten all their information now. We're just waiting on a first draft of it. They've been here. This, this is 2019, okay? We ended the year. So the SU with a $830,000 deficit. Did you bill that out to the school? Yes, we have to. That's part of your deficit. And what you see on that top line on your deficit, that's your portion of that. Right. But 
August, you said the deficit was 560,000. Well, that's for 1920. I guess, I guess that's what, we're that's what we're projecting for the audit that's currently in the works. So yeah, the 2019 SU deficit is included in what's listed in the document Tara was just showing in the 400,000 that we owed from 2019, because that was assessed out already and it's included in that deficit number. The 500,000 of which we're gonna, you know, have $100,000 or whatever of, isn't included in that line. Okay. So yeah, as soon as we get those audited numbers, Bob, can you keep going down, Ray? Do you see, Bob, I'm pointing to my screen, which doesn't help you, because Ray's got <laughs> But FY20 not audited, that 563, that yeah, was what I was saying to Lisa is gonna change right. once we confirm the dollar figure that we presented to you in August. Mm -hmm. F four seven one nine four nine took care of that deficit that you're talking about at night. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and uh, Tara, there were several recommendations that the auditor made, and I want to be sure that we're paying attention to them. Um, and I saw your responses, but I just want to be sure that they're taken care of. Do we have a procurement policy for federal grants? Yes. Where's the policy? You can find it on our website. Okay, all right. Is it? And we have policy? it here and they have to use it when they're making any federal grant purchases. Okay, all right. We continue to update those procedures too, Bob. We literally just did a new version again last week. Because one of the problems was um, not keeping track of grant money and where it was going and uh, not keeping track of employee salaries or payments and not where, where that money where that money was going. And we might end up having to pay some of that back, I can see. Um, and then um, a question about it said we were very slow about turning in our reports for federal grants. Has that changed? Yes. There when the state went to the reimbursement platform for grants before this that you were able to get a lump sum first and then they would send you additional funds. When they changed the grant management system, it now is a reimbursement system. And you, it's at your discretion how often you wish to pull down your grant funds. And we are, our goal is to do it on a monthly 30 to 45 day cycle. And we are meeting that goal. Okay, all right, that's good, okay. Um, and that special ed too? Special ed is paid differently than the grant management system. We get portions of funds from the Agency of Education throughout the year, like we just received our second special education payment today. And then we also have to submit what's called the special education expenditure report, which is a cumulative report throughout the entire fiscal year. And we have points that the AOE has determined when we have to do that submission. And we submit that and that validates the additional funds that we receive from them. And then also if we need additional funds, they'll send us additional. Okay, my answer, uh, my question is, are we doing it and we're getting them done on time? Yep. Okay. Um, and the other thing, and I, and, I keep, and I keep harping on this and so does Andrew, but uh, encumbrances. And there's a little statement in this report about encumbrances. I just want to read it to the board.
Encumbrances are not liabilities and therefore are not recorded as expenditures until receipt of material or service. For budgetary purposes, appropriations lapse at the end of the physical year. The supervisory union does not utilize encumbrance accounting for its general fund. Now, during the preparation of the supervisory union's financial statement, management is required to make estimates and assumptions that affect the reported amounts of assets, liabilities, and disclosure of um, contingent items as the date of the financial statements and reported amounts of revenue and expenditures during the reporting period. Actual results may differ from these estimates. And that's why I keep harping on encumbrances and making sure that we understand where we are at all times in the budget and that we don't, we don't end up making guesses at the very end. That's my spiel. And that's why I think encumbrances are important. And if you look at the budget, I think, Terry, you've encumbered um, teachers' salaries and health benefits. Teachers' contracted salaries are encumbered through the payroll system. Yeah, and they're encumbered in your, um, you know, your financial report that you usually give out every month. Are health benefits encumbered too? No, they are not. All right, so teacher salaries, how much do we spend every month on teacher salaries? How much is a basic payroll run? For salaries. Sorry, I'm looking for my notes for you, Bob. Yes, Owen. Seems like a lot to ask the business manager to answer this question on the spot. I can tell you what I think it is, 250,000. Yep, I just found my notes. It's generally around 244,000. All right. And um, our um, warrants, from the beginning of July until uh, the 1st of September, add up to about 300,000. So that's 500,000 a month. And our teacher's, sal our teacher's salaries are uh, 500,000 a month. So that's a million a month. We have a budget that's $12 million. So we are really close to that, just guessing. We're spending a million dollars a month. We've been through um, six months already. So we spent $6 million and we have uh, 4.6 left not counting teacher salaries. I take that back. I don't think we have that much left. We have. Uh, uh, what was the number that you said from July 1st to the beginning of September for um, Warren? Yeah, 300,000. Okay. 
and I, I think uh, Tara's report um, at the end of November was 4.6 left in the budget and not counting teacher salaries because she encumbered that. So we're looking really close at our budget coming in really, really close. And I think, Jamie, what I would ask you to do is think about that million dollars a month and what kind of savings we can have until the end of the year. And you're kind of doing that with this report. Um, but I guess I'd like to see a savings around, I don't know, 300,000. A no, month? 300,000. And you already have 100,000. The question is, can you do it before be, in the last six months? And I, we're going to have to go into town meeting in a really tough time. And the state's talking about a 9% increase in the tax rate. And voters are going to be scared. And if they vote, um, and if and if they vote Australian ballot and mail-in ballot, um, it's going to be a surprise. So I think all that we can do to make make them feel like we're working at it is important. So that's that's my way of looking at it. You know, a million dollars a month, and if you anything you can come under a million is going to be good. No, thanks, Bob. And you know, part of those warrants do include your expenditures for COVID, which was upwards around one hundred and fifty. And so, you know, my hope is that we get full reimbursement for that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know it also includes uh, the ventilation at the high school. Right. And that's the efficiency Vermont. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, I, yeah, if you just think, if you think a million a month and where you can cut or what you can, how you can manage, I guess, um, maybe we come out with a good result. That's all I, well, Don McMahon can tell you the heat's low in the central office. He told me it's wicked cold in here. <laughs> you know me, I got to bring a little humor, but it, <laughs> the heating system is pretty funky in here. <laughs> Thank you. I want to look and see if I, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Okay. Bob, I will just give the board an update with the audit. So I got to meet uh, a bunch of my staff with the auditor in the last several weeks. But I did get uh, to meet with the auditor that was on the ground that did our single audits last week. And um, he is completed. My sense is that there's nothing more needed. Um, and we'll get the drafts of the SU and RUD budget, uh, audits first. Um, and they're telling me still that those drafts will be completed by the end of the month. And I've talked to the managing partner and Tara. My sense is, is that, and they presented at the Rudd Finance Committee, that we shouldn't have multiple drafts. I mean, this should be pretty quick and good. clean. So, good. Um, at least we'll have numbers to utilize for January. You know what I mean? We shouldn't see yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I did have another question. A huge shout out to Rose. And Tara and everyone that you know worked really hard. Rose is behind the scenes, and she worked really hard, our accountant, to make certain that that was ready to roll. Um, and you know they they've spoken to me and said just we have come leaps and bounds to where we were last year to now, and that we had everything prepared, and that means we're not going to incur those additional costs. Which what is about, good. okay, yeah, I I. I I thought the audit report was really good at the finance committee meeting. And um, um, my question is, are are we up to date right now with uh, uh, 2021? We spent a lot of time getting ready for the audit, but are we ready this year, right now? Are we up to date? Have we reconciled all our accounts? 
we are working through the reconciliation of the additional changes that we need to make that we discovered during the FY20 audit process. Um, payroll has gone through an internal audit. Um, they are almost completed. They're down to their last few dis, uh, deduction sections that they need to complete. So yes, we're working through that to make sure that we're up to date for that as well. But I mean, Tara, I'm, I'm talking about from July to right now, December. Yes, we are working through our them. Book, are our books up to date? Yes. Okay. They've had to adjust a little, Bob, due to the fact that as we were working through payroll, that things were still not being coded exactly where we wanted them and that needed to get fixed. And I gotta say, um, Jason's been working incredibly hard on that, just so you know, you don't hear his voice, his name mentioned much, but he's been working hard with Rob and Ann Rose and Tara. Um, I can speak to the fact that I do see that that team is starting to solidify, which I'm happy about. Okay. The uh, Rose spent a lot of time getting ready for the audit. So I'm wondering, that's why I'm wondering if, if our books are up to date from July 1 till now, are our current books up to date? That's what I'm asking. Our bank accounts are reconciled through the end of October. We're waiting for the supporting documentation for the November bank statement reconciliations, if that's what you're asking, Bob. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's good, knowing that you had to do a lot of work to get ready for the audit. So, good. I just don't want any surprises. I just want to know where we are. No. You and me both. Okay. I I feel like you're on the same page. We all have the same goal. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to start spending time doing my real job, Bob. <laughs> Great. Um, shall we move on? It feels like that's a pretty good transition spot to move on um, to the budget for next year, which is our next agenda item. So our 21-22 budget, our third draft. Yeah, and I'll start by saying I'm with you as a board. We want to get this to you sooner. Um, and it's really not, you know, the goal, Karen knows, our goal is to get them in the packets um, when they come to you. And, you know, part of the holdup with this one partly was the audit. Um, you know, it's not an excuse, but we were prioritizing that. And so, hence, this was late coming out to you. We had a draft done, but we wanted to all sit down and meet and dot the I's and cross the T's. So what I can tell you is that the administrations work really hard. I sat in an hour and a half meeting with them today doing just that. I really think you have real numbers and real budgets and there's no surprises. Um, and so that feels really good and um, that they've really been going through everything in double, triple, quadruple checking. And so um, this is rolled up in function, um, function code. And uh, Bob, you remember you and I spoke about this type of concept um, based on some examples you saw where you previously worked. And I do think it gives a better direction around talking about the overall um, programming. You'll get all the line items next month um, but we wanted to be able to kind of paint more of a picture and give you a sense of where things are. You know, some districts, this is what they roll out. Our districts are not used to this, right? So we understand that. Um, but I do think this is easier to follow and it's something I might look to include in all of our communications. I haven't even talked to Terry yet about that. My rules don't surprise people, but, um, based on feedback I've been getting from boards, they've liked this. So I think it should be part of the information that goes out um, in the uh, annual report, because I think for some folks, folks, this is easier to follow versus all the line items. So I think we'll provide both a function code budget and all the line item codes. Um, so folks have both. And so, you know, I've challenged administration um, to look at trying to come in around a one to 2% budget um and your administration's coming in with essentially a flat just under um 
they can highlight what this proposal consists of. Do realize that there's some reductions in staff in this. We did not want to have, it's been my um, approach that we did not want to have conversations with all specific folks around reductions in staff until after the holidays. And so um, we're, what you're going to see is here, we're not prepared to talk about all the individual positions because I don't think that's fair to folks until we can have a conversation with them. What I will tell you is, is that we've tried to focus on not replacing outgoing staff as a number one means to get us down. And so we looked at that first, and then we also looked at where could there be some reductions in force and not impact programming and or direct instruction to students. Okay, so part of that, as you know, this budget does include not replacing a music position. And Andra sent you a document on that that she worked on with the principals. And Andrew, I knew that was a request of yours. So we're gonna go over that afterwards because I know that's been a question for some folks. This budget also includes, can you go up, Ray? Um, you'll see a slight decrease in regards to foreign language. All the same level of programming will occur at the middle and high school, but we're gonna approach foreign language differently through a cultural approach at the elementary mm. school and not through direct instruction around a weekly foreign language. Um, and that's currently what's happening right now. That's not a change, um, but I do want you to see that. And so those are the things I wanted to highlight. I need to remind you that the next time we meet, you'll get revenue that you need to couple with this. And of course the yield will be hopefully a little more cemented based on just all we've received so far is that document that I shared with you. Um, and we were still looking for ADM to get finalized and equalized pupil. So we don't even have that information yet. We're still waiting on it from the state. As soon as we get it, that will of course be inputted into your tax sheet. Um, but taxes are gonna go up. I just, I can't emphasize that enough. Due to the yield and even what we do with expenditures, and this doesn't include, of course, however we anticipate handling the deficit. And we need to figure that out at a run finance committee and then bring that to you in the proposal in your January meeting. Um, keeping this budget as flat or less than is I think really important to having a sustainable budget. And so I'll leave it at that because there's a lot of other things that we gotta take into account that's gonna impact taxes. Principals, do you want to highlight some of the other things you're excited about? Because this does include additional programming and pathways, which is a full-time position. It includes the um, intensive support program at the high school, um, which we're hoping to draw additional students in, um, into the SU, and then also keep our students in the SU home. But they'll also be tuition students to your school because they will be RUD students. Um, I don't think it's wise for us to budget that way, by the way, right now. I'm not gonna anticipate them as students because I, again, wanna be conservative on budgeting revenues. But I do think we're gonna see an influx of some students across the SU come into that programming, as well as service some of our students who are currently at a district placed. Um, and so know that this does support all that as well as beefs up some of your outdoor ed. And Owen, take it from there, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, so, you know, I, I think we should, this would be a year when we would be scared and like really cowering. And at this, right now we're like, I think we're so strong. I was looking at our numbers today and that we are about, 21 we are, are actually 21 students up by state count today from two years ago and we've gained about 10 a year let's average that out and if we kept that projection up and it's not a trend because i think you need three years for trend but we have two years which is awesome and one of the things we're doing is trying to create a program that is a niche program that nobody else offers in the valley where something like outdoor education and our like middle school shop program, or we have a high school shop, 
And we're going to build a flexible pathways program into that where we can say we're not like Randolph and we're not like Sharon. And those are our high school feeder programs. And it's not the business we're in, but the business we're in is offering an education that meets children and families needs. And we know people are more open to that and more open to the outdoor education, hands-on place-based learning, programming and personalized learning. So <clears throat> we've gained 20 students in, in two years and we know every student. I can tell you, even in a pandemic, our new students at the middle school, I make a concerted effort to know them and to make sure the teachers know them and that their families know that because, and it's not like a sales pitch, it's reality. Knowing people, having a relationship with them builds the safety of students learning and taking risks and their families smiling when they know their children are at our school. There's a couple teachers on this in this meeting. I see Cass's face and I don't see some other faces, but they know this, that the key is, and all of you who support education know this, that if we can lift those families up and, and let them know that their children aren't going to school, they're going to a place where they're cared for and loved. And we talk about love at our school, which is unique. And I love that we do that. How am I doing, Jamie? Is, am I going too far? He walks me back from the plank. And, and Lisa's shaking her head, no, you're not going too far. Because you know what? What if we were the school where families said, oh, Rodney's got it, where families said, I know my children are cared for, loved, and are engaging every day in a safe way and taking risks. I love our school, by the way. People ask me, I'm gonna go a little tangent. Why do you drive 42.3 miles? They don't know my mileage. Each day, one way. And I'll tell you, I, it is because I know what we're doing is the right thing. We are engaging. And I look at our board and the complexity of it. And Bob Gray, thank you for asking hard questions. Thank you for keeping me honest and keeping all of us honest. And you're like, you're the continuum of who we are. You are part of our diversity. Andrew Jones on the other side of like, where's our music? Where's our pre-K teacher? I love that about us. And you know what? I'll leave a meeting and I'll be like, dang, those guys. I mean, I say, dang, I don't curse, but how am I doing? I'll stop. Because yeah, you're I, good. Thank you, Owen. Yeah. That was good. So, Andrew, do you want to talk about, I mean, we, we kept staffing levels are very similar, just so you know, to this current year. Do you want to just jump on to that, Andrew? Uh, I would just say that I'm, I'm excited. I was a little nervous about us maybe having to cut some regular ed teachers. Um, so I'm happy that we were able to retain all of our regular ed teachers. And I'm really excited to look forward to next year so that we can do um, more intervention and, and more specialized teaching um, with just being able to move around and not be potted as much. So um, I think that is the biggest highlight for me is uh, just that we were able to retain every elementary uh, classroom teaching position at this point. And, and I'll just add, I don't want to, you see function codes like art. There's not a reduction in art there. That is cleaning up some coding. We're still doing that. All right. So right. we're trying to get people in the right places. Um, keep rolling up for me, Ray. Go up. Yeah. You see, uh, you know, there's, there is a significant difference in regular ed instruction. And again, if you remember previous two, some of that was around coding and us getting them coded appropriately if they are interventionists. And if yeah, you go I've down, never uh, ever answered so many questions about drilling down on exactly what everybody does, but I think we have answered those questions so much now that Tara must dream about what percentage each person is. <laughs> Would it be possible to get a notes column where you could collaborate on, you know, like the math is up, 
ninety thousand. That's because regular, that came out of the regular. Event. So if we could get a note saying, you know, ninety thousand of math, whatever, so that we can see which ones are actually changing, which ones are just coding things, that'd be really helpful. Absolutely. And just I'll remind the board we did share with you um, the line item budget as well, but we can definitely put notes there too for this purpose. Yeah. Right. I would say, Andrew, you, you'll appreciate the, the workbook, uh, but where there was a significant change in one of the line items, uh, say, for example, um, for athletics contracted services, we realized we spend about $3,500 a year on field maintenance. And so I reduced uh, the amount of money from the grounds contracted services line, and I moved that into the athletics contracted services line because it's really more about you know striping lines and you know aerating the field and that sort of thing um, just to give you a better sense of where that is but those notes will be in the workbook uh, where there's a significant change I think uh, I would point out a couple of big things that you'll they'll catch your eye as you look at this uh, about a third of the way down the page uh, in function 1127 the planning room that, that really went away with the merger, but we've had some, some costs that have been coded to there. And so that's gonna go away, but, but that, some of those expenses are covered now by 2190 student support. So that student support is now $258,000, which is a whole new line, but some costs have been rolled from other areas to that. Um, the other example I'd give of that is uh, the line function 2100 student assistant program services uh, we currently fund a student assistant professional uh, through attrition that person will be leaving us at the end of uh, 2020 uh, and going into private practice uh, we won't replace that person but we have uh, you know the coordinator student support and two mtss coordinators that can fill that a need for our students and we feel comfortable that they're they're more than capable of doing that uh, and that we won't need that position back in the budget next year can you elaborate on what they were doing just you know it's kind of a generic title so uh, the student assistance program uh, originally I I that that position was created as part of uh, drug and alcohol grant money uh, and over the years the amount of that salary that was paid by the grant has kind of gotten eaten away at. Uh, so, you know, last year we were left holding most of the cost of that salary. Uh, they, they work with students to look at the youth risk behavior survey that comes out every year and come up with strategies for how to improve the culture of the school and some of the youth risk behaviors around alcohol and drug use, for example. Um, at times they've sponsored group uh, discussion sessions to help support students with different issues. Uh, Primarily, it's one-to-one -one student support. So if a student is grieving, a student is having problems at home, problems in a class, uh, they can get time with that person uh, to get, you know, talk through what's going on and come up with strategies for coping. And so, Andrew, that support won't go away. The SU, we're looking to contract with Clara Martin at a much more reduced cost to provide a school-based clinician. For the SU um, and use IDA B funds to cover that. And so that doesn't mean that students couldn't get that level of service. Um, it just means that it would come from the SU, uh, but it won't, it'll be grant funded through IDA B. So we don't have to worry about what was that, supplanting or whatever when you. Like, no, because the licensure is the licensure is even different. A school based clinician has a different license. Great. That school-based clinician, Jerry, what is it, a district? Going to be district-wide? It'd be district-wide, yep. Just one? For now. They're hard to find. You know, and if it goes well, then we'll continue to increase. The, you know, the more we can work with uh, mental health, um, community mental health is a big draw for me because we can build down on Medicaid, they can, um, which gets our contracts down. And so, you know, we're looking right now, an example is in FBUD, 
we have two, and that's uh, First Branch Unified District, if you didn't know, in Tombridge and Chelsea, they're piloting two behavioral analysts right now that we contract for through Claire Martin, who provide behavioral supports and um, targeting the intensive behavioral plans. But we're able to offer that at the rate of about 38,000 for a full-time FTE um, because we're able to build down Medicaid through Claire Martin. And they take care of the build down. We're not having to do that. My experience with, uh, my experience has never been good with Claire Martin. So. Well, I, you know, I, I heard that a lot when I came. Um, and I think that they're very motivated to work with us and partner with us. And I've seen nothing but that. They've been wicked responsive. And, um, you know, I had a really good relationship in the past with Washington County, and that was successful. And so I'm trying to take what I've learned with from there and work with them in collaboration and make certain they do that with Claire Martin. And I got to say, they've been very open to feedback and receptive to what's worked um, in their, you know, sister organization to the north of Washington County. Um, they've, I know that they've taken information from them and used it to try to improve programming. And I also think they were very motivated to service us, uh, partly because they no longer operate the Wilder School down in Hartford. So um, I think that the timing was right to have a strong relationship. And the good news is, Bob, when it doesn't work, guess what? It's a contract to service it worked for me. We're no longer in the contract and it's pretty clean. Okay. I, I, I've always had my own clinician and 100% in the school. So, um, one other thing, transportation. Um, I have some ideas on transportation. What are you thinking? I'll talk. I, I'll. I'll go over talk to me you. offline? No, no, yeah, yeah. I'll go over with you first rather than. All right, and we can talk about the finance committee. Okay. That sounds great. Um, so I had one question about the school-based clinician. When you talk about the school-based clinician being district-wide, you mean just White River Unified District and not like... Uh, this person we, is not responsible for Chelsea, Tunbridge, Bethel, Royalton. It's an SU contract, so we will use it to support our most intensive needs students right now across the SU. It takes about 25 students, just so you know. That's about 25 to 30 uh -huh. um, is what a typical counselor will be able to case manage and, and caseload. And so we'll start there. Once they're full, then we would look to add additional. The problem is right now, I've been trying to get um, mental health counselors in place for us, both private and through Claire Martin all year. I reached out to the 10 I used in Williamstown and uh, I haven't been able to get anyone yet. So, you know, that's that's part of the challenge right now. And my sense is we'd struggle to find anyone at this point as well. Yeah. And part of the yeah. plus is, you know, these folks, are always looking for supervision. They work on a different licensure. And so that supervision time is really important and community mental health can provide it um, for them. And so that is a, sometimes a bigger desire for folks to join because at least they can get their clinical supervision where we're not able to provide that for them. Right. Okay, thank you. So you're confident that our mental health needs will be met between the MTSS um, supports our student services and um, this this role. I'm just I just know that there's a lot um, a lot that our students struggle in their lives. I just want to make sure we have what they need. We still have a relationship with Health Hub and can refer through them as it, well. Okay. It's, it's also worth noting that the SAP uh, attrition is, um, and I think it's okay to talk about this, she's going into private practice at the South Royalton Health Clinic. Uh, and so she has connections with students right now who are on her SAP caseload. Um, 
And if they need extensive counseling, she may be able to continue to serve them through the private practice. Uh, so we're kind of, it's a, a bit of a win-win in that we're getting, in, you know, in South Royalton for our community, we're getting a, you know, a soon to be licensed clinician uh, who already has relationships with many of our students um, will be able to continue to support them. Uh, yeah, and the plan is, is that, you know, the Health Hub has a strong relationship with us. They're also looking to provide therapeutic interventions for us and this is part of that pilot. And okay. so they, they will continue to work with our students but they'll build directly and you know we will work on coordination of making certain spaces provided a lot of it's all you know virtual at this point but in the future that the space is provided and things of that nature but they're a health hub employee they service our students but they're not they're not our employees which comes with you know significant savings to the district yes um owen i did see your hand up as well yeah, and it's the same as Andrea, Reed, and Jamie, but I wanted to say that I wanted to thank Amelia Lincoln for her service to this community as an employee or contracted employee, and now we will contract her differently, and it might be something the board wants to recognize, but, and also, I think the system that Jamie's brought to us of looking at everybody as it, an interventionist so each teacher each faculty member staff member sees themselves as helping starts to support every child and every family and that we we can really lift everybody up and we are building a system within our system of restorative practice where that is about helping everybody and solving problems it's part of the intervention concept, but that intervention is not for those in need, it's for everyone. I'm really happy and excited about what we're doing. And I just, I want you to know that I feel like we're building a systems within systems. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, okay. uh, I wanna say something, Lisa, I agree with you. And I, I there are some, there are some students that need mental health counseling and that could happen any time during the week, day or whatever. And it's really important that they have access to it right at that moment, in my experience. And, and that's a little more than a teacher, a principal or a guidance counselor can do. And that's why mental health that mental health counselor, that school psychologist is really important. So, you know, you, you, know, you guys do still have an SAP, just so you know, as well, that's contracted through the SU that is paid for via the uh, consolidated federal grant that essentially services you guys 80% of the time. So that is available still. Is that well. person a licensed psychologist? We don't have anyone that's licensed, including yeah. the SAP. Right. But need, uh, John is looking, just so you know, Bob, at the idea of instead of us contracting all of our school psychology to bring on potentially one or two school psychologists that can service our students and conduct our own evals. Okay. And I actually think there'll be significant savings potentially if we do that based on what you've been budgeting for all these um, evals and outside consult, uh, psychologists. So that will be part of what we talk about too next week um, is that concept. Yeah. The problem, with that, the problem with that is that a person gets into those evals and they don't have time to, to individually counsel the kid. So we'll be talking about that more at the SU level because those would be supervisory union employees, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, because it's it's really important for us to try to leverage all your um, federal funds you receive, like IDA, AB, and I can do that through the SU. Hence why we would contract school um, clinicians through the SU. And because we pay 40 per 40. 40%, we get 40% of that person? No. 
No, it's just, you know, it's how they centralize special ed, like we talked about. I understand. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to bring that up. Sorry about that. <laughs> I know. I know you do. <laughs> um, okay. Other questions about this budget. Um, and I just want to say, like, typically a level funded budget, it, you know, sustains a 2% increase. And this actually is a reduction in cost. Um, so I'm hoping um, that people will will appreciate that because I know it is a really hard financial time for a lot of families. So, you know, I'm looking, you know, we're going to be working with the finance committee on how we want to best handle our deficit here in a couple of weeks. And that will be part of the next round of budget. You know, I think it's important, you know, for the board to note um, that most districts are seeing anywhere from a 10 to 12 cent increase based on that yield before expenditures or revenues are looked at locally. So, you know, is there a goal from the board in regards to tax rate or are you feeling, you know, that the expenditure side was important to you? I mean, what, what are you thinking about um, in that regard? I'm thinking that you should provide, I'm thinking that you should bring forward a budget like you are. You're taking care of the educational needs of the kids and then we're gonna have to sit and decide whether it's too much or too little. So I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, so I think, you know, you're, you're doing what I would do. You know, you're, you're presenting the best case scenario for the schools and for you and I think we need to look at it but we got to be re we got to be ready to defend and explain to the people why it's important mm -hmm. Andrew yeah I mean I think that that's right you, you should present the budget that you think is appropriate um you know looking at the yield numbers that they give it was a two percent increase so I, you know i think that nine or nine percent increase included you know expected local expenditure spending increases so you know, yeah i was saying cents, not percent cents right but that's still more than anyway whatever doesn't matter <laughs> um yeah anyway so you know, I think if we are able to maintain, and it's really hard to say now because we don't know our student numbers or, you know, that's a big part of it or what, you know, you guys are projecting for revenue. So we kind of need to be able to see that stuff before we make any decisions on anything. And, you know, like with, with what you presented here, you know, it is nice to see the numbers and your overall thing, but you know, until we can see specifically, like it's hard to tell because of the coding changes, what actually changed. And you're saying you don't want to get into the details because of the staffing. You want to talk to staff first. So it's hard for us to buy, provide feedback when we can't actually see what really different, if you know what I mean. You know, you've provided yeah. a couple of examples, but. Um, and you, you know, it, part of this too is just, you know, me also trying to get the board from looking at line by line budgets, Andrew, and trying to look at programming in the bottom line, because, you know, the board in the in the town votes on a bottom line. And so, you know, that's part of, you know, the strategy around this as well. Um, and again, you have your budget workbook and can look at it. Um, right. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, I wasn't I just, talking about like looking line by line, but more you know, if we are talking about, you know, changes, then like we need some way of knowing what those are. I mean, yeah, I think that at least if it helps you sleep a little better at night, none of the changes that we're making will affect direct instruction of academics. Right. Um, principles, is that fair? You know, it's gonna, be a little more strategic on how we approach things 
um, and there's some shifting of staff and things, but um, we have not cut any programs. Yeah, and just to clarify, you know, I trust that you guys are doing your job well, and you know, I trust your judgment on things. So it's more just at some point we need to be able to get into the details. So. Yeah, and that will be your next round. You'll definitely have that in January. Um, the Andre, can you review the music document just because I know that was a request to the board? I'd like to be able to go over that. Yeah, I, Ray, are you going to project it? It's magical, Ray. I can know that. Of course, he is. So I didn't know if I didn't know what the best way was to go about this. So I tried to. Um, just summarize what this year looks like um, and just give us just the facts. And so right now, due to COVID, we opened up to doing elementary um, music one time a week. Um, we're just kind of going slow, although we had planned for a schedule that would offer to do music twice a week. Um, we haven't gone straight back to that open, open schedule. Um, so what I understand is that there's also some this is the summary of sort of what we're doing right now. It's not what our what we were planning for, but it's what we're doing given a, a pandemic. So seventh grade is having sort of a flipped model. So some in person, some online. Eighth grade has some curl virtual lessons. Um, there are instrumental lessons happening. Um, I know band is happening. And in high school, again, choral virtual and then band is happening. So, but looking to next year, because we're planning for hopefully more normalcy. Mr. Ballou, if you can please scroll. Can I interrupt for a second real quick? Um, just, just to be clear, band is happening with major modifications. Uh, at the high school, they're only playing outside. Uh, so we, we may not be practicing together when the cold weather comes here. Uh, they they went out on Monday to the town green at the, you know because it was a nice hour the, the nicest day of the week uh, yeah. and played some songs out in the green and that's probably going to be it for four or five weeks at least. And I thought that maybe the function of this was to really talk about what next year would look like, but I yeah. thought it would be helpful yeah. to just have a grounding of what this year kind of looks like. And this this is not what this year started to look like. Oh, and did you have your hand raised or not really? Not really. Okay. So <laughs> we are going with goals of having two elementary music classes um, per classroom a week and moving towards elementary chorus and fifth grade band. So it's per normal. Um, in the middle school, sixth grade general music class, sixth grade choral, seventh and eighth choral, sixth grade band lessons, seventh and eighth band and, band and lessons and jazz band. And in the high school choral is normal, band is normal and hopefully jazz band. Uh, so in the budget, you'll see, if you keep on scrolling, Mr. Ballou, thank you, <laughs> that we did budget for lessons. I know the last few years, um, we were under the belief that we were going to be reimbursed by Ellis for some of that stuff, and it hasn't happened. So we did budget for private, or not private, but lessons to continue. And I know Mr. Canarni was reached out to by uh, Trey Fisk, who runs the B Sharp prep program um, and does offer some online, I don't know enough about it, I haven't had the presentation, but some online music lessons. So um, looking into that as another opportunity for us to pursue. Um, we are reimbursing our music teachers who are going to and fro between campuses uh, for mileage. And we have upped the dues and fees so that we can participate in all the festivals that we want to. And I think also on the table is talking about how concerts will look like going forward, when and if we can do them, just recognizing that um, we're doing more with less, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna be able to look exactly like it did last year. So to be determined, or maybe not last year, but the last time we could do concerts. <laughs> And I'd encourage you guys to visit the B-Sharp. Um, I think that's a really exciting pilot from Trey, who was a student at Sharon Elementary um, and then graduated from Sharon Academy. But he came back and uh, this is a, an upstart program that I think is going to possibly really take off. There are, he's already got 10 
um, really highly qualified musicians who are going to be offering lessons and we're already starting to pilot this at two of our elementary schools um, and he's looking to sign on more and the cost the fee is very minimal um, and it's a sliding scale based on need um, and so we're going to look to partner this throughout the SU the only um, schools that have been offered a pilot on this project thus far are Sharon Academy and us um, so I feel really honored and um, and Trey, if you know Trey Fisk, um, he's a terrific young man, and um, I think he's on to something here with this project. So please, uh, I encourage you to visit that, that hyperlink um, in the document that uh, Andrew said, sh shared, because the plus of that too is as our, kids, our students have become more accustomed to virtual learning, uh, this now opens up the opportunity for lessons um, significantly is also other performing arts. Um, they're looking to expand it more into theater and things of that nature as well. So it's another exciting enrichment for our kids. I appreciate that. Ray just put the um, link to his website in the chat. So anybody who's joining on a computer, um, please feel free to load that and take a look. I looked at it really briefly after I got the report from Andra. Um, and it looks like an exciting opportunity. Um, I know that there are people here who want to discuss the music program. Um, it's my hope that we can get through the next two agenda items and save questions about that until our next public comment, um, which is which we're rapidly approaching. Um, but I'd like to work our way through the rest of the agenda, um, and then we can get into a deeper discussion about that. Any other questions about the budget or questions about music um, from the board? Well, would you like me to hold questions on that until later? Like, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like you have to hold questions about that um, for public comment. I just want to make sure we finish the business that's on our agenda um, before we go too deeply with public. Um, yeah, I do appreciate that summary of it. It's nice to see what the vision is for when there is you know the one elementary teacher splitting campuses um but it would have been good to include what it was before um covid because you know basically the what i wanted to see was how is it different from when we have the two staff down to what it looks like with one like did we have just two music lessons per week currently in the elementary yes okay and uh, I mean, I, I could even do more research and tell and look around and see what other schools offer. I think there's some other schools no. that do, do only no, offer. I'm just but... curious, you know, like, did the music teachers have a bunch of extra time or, you know, like, how are I mean, we able right, to offer right the same thing? Right, right now, yes. I think um, yeah. Carrie Cole started off her year doing, being assigned to be a buddy teacher. I mean, that's how we started well, our I year. Mean, I mean, last year when we had a, a teacher yes. for each campus, you know, we're, we're, decreasing the staff by one but it doesn't seem like we're decreasing. so they but they weren't focused last year right so i uh, you know and carrie's here she could talk about she well she, no i'm not going to do that so i'm, yeah, I'm going to okay. interject i think andrew part of how we're going to find efficiencies is looking and saying how does the schedule support what's best for kids and prioritizes what you want right and so part of the challenge around making certain that you can find more efficiencies in staffing is to ensure that you have schedules that support it. And so I can't speak to what your schedules were two years ago. What I can say is, is that we're gonna make certain we have schedules as we move forward that ensures that your priorities are upheld. And so, you know, that means making certain the elementary school, school schedules complement each other around essentials to ensure that one teacher can support two campuses without them you know, going crazy. And so that's the challenge around this, right? And so I think that's, um, that's part of it is ensuring that the schedules all complement each other. Um, and I know that you know, that's part of what Andrea and Reed had to do. I mean, I remember interviewing at the South Rollins campus and hearing from teachers saying, we don't currently schedule as an elementary and high school, right? Like that wasn't over, they didn't look at that together. 
And so now we're saying, no, we have to look at that. And, you know, the principles a few years ago, you know, this got voted through and they didn't have much time to make pull this merger off. And so I think now we're really analyzing each part of your system to say, is it as efficient as it can be? And I think that you're going to continue to see us say in areas that we think we can be just, we can be more efficient and offer the same programming. Okay. Well, if, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I, know of any significant cuts, cuts in principles, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe that this proposal cuts anything. Well, it, I mean, it, we, we could argue that the music composition class at the high school that we put in the, the program of studies isn't going to be there anymore because we won't have staff for that. This year, one student signed up for it. Um, it it's not really a sustainable model to have, a, you know, a $12,000, $15,000 staff position to teach one student in music composition. Um, and so our music teachers now are spending more time doing music lessons at the middle school, uh, and that student's taking in an independent study on the side with the teacher. So, I mean, it, it's a trade-off. I, I don't think we're, we're sacrificing uh, much in the way of programming, but it's definitely more cost-effective for everybody. Yeah. Well, that, that's good. Um, one comment I did have just generally on the music program, um, you know, I know doing in-person band isn't feasible this year, but for the fifth graders to, um, you know, my son, so, like, who would normally be picking up a, a instrument this year, might be good just to have something go out where you can have them pick up an instrument and start working on it independently. You know, I don't know how it normally works. You know, normally we would have had the kids pick up an instrument and start doing it in band and it might be good um, I saw Owen unmute so I suspect he has something to share about middle level music yeah and uh, Jamie asked and Andrew just so you know you were breaking up for me I'm not sure about others maybe thumbs up thumbs down thumbs sideways but anyway um, you know we would like to offer everything we really would. And when I saw our math scores, and I know there's a math teacher on this call, and I know the argument that the more music we have, the stronger the math we have. I just, I just really want to remember that if we have three music teachers in a student body of 581 students, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that we have that. And I know one of the concerns was an, an accompanist. And I think we'll, fit, we'll solve our problems. But I feel really proud of what we offer for music. And I, I'm not thinking about the pandemic. But we have a really powerful program. And I think a big part of that is because of our people. It's because of Carrie, Shannon, and Josh. And I'm really proud of how they've worked hard to work together. And the three principals will also support them. We had four principals at one time, but we have three. We can't always have all of it, but we will work hard to make all of our students have all of what they need. I'm really proud and I know that like I I supervise Shannon and Josh if you will with the new model we have two I know the people I supervise are two of the most top-notch and Carrie I'm not speaking poorly of you top-notch music educators I've seen I've been a school principal for 21 years I'm really proud of what we're doing good work to them and I I feel like sometimes it undermines them or separates us but know this that they they bring their heart and soul to this every day and the decisions we have to make 
tell them how we feel about them, but we need those three people. And those three people can make this music program happen. I've seen it. And it's not four people, but it's three people who are dedicated and talented and love children. I'll stop there, Lisa. Thank you, Owen. I think I think one of the things um, that does make this discussion really challenging is that, I, I mean, over the time that I've served on this board, um, certainly one of the things that we're very proud of in this system and we want to hold on to is the focus on music and and the excellence that we've experienced in the music program and. Um, we do value the people who work with our kids in the music program. Um, so that, I think that's why whenever music is going to be on the agenda, we see you know a number of community members come to our meetings um, because it is a value um, in our system. So I do appreciate that and, and I appreciate you all speaking to it. So thank you. Other other questions about that or the third draft of the budget? Okay, so we'll we'll move forward to the Australian ballot um, section on the agenda. So the update from the Vermont School Boards Association. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk to you guys about um, my sense is that you're looking to move forward with an Australian ballot in March. Um, and so with that said, the thing to know is that Bethel's town book needed to be done by January 8th, Lisa. And I'm just, I, you know, I talked to Lisa Floyd. I said I was not feeling comfortable when I talked to her about us pulling it off and having the right information and accurate information then, specifically to when I'm not even certain we'd have our equalized pupil number. And so I do think based on that deadline that we may be looking at doing our own mailing. And I just wanted to see what how the board felt about that. Um, I, I would rather have us, uh, well, I, other people can comment first. Um, we printed it our own for Bethel last year, right? Not for Royalton. I think we printed our own is that right? Both last year. No, I'm pretty sure Royalton came in the town report. Okay. It was just for Bethel last yeah. year. So do we know how much that was just printing and mailing was? I'm just curious. I mean, I think it's clear that you know, we're not going to have a budget ready to go with everything ready by January 8th. That's so kind of a moot discussion. We're going right. to print our own. <laughs> but, well, my thoughts just sort of was as you guys come together as a district, It'd be nice to have the same materials go out to both sides and look okay. the same. I thought, um, and I think it would give us the opportunity to include um, some more data points and things. I really want the book to be as informational as possible, and really convey the great things you have going and celebrate those. I've talked to the principals about my desire to have pictures in the book mm -hmm. this upcoming year to highlight things that folks are proud of. Um, how, how hard everyone's been working. I think that that's going to be really important. You also don't have that informational meeting happening the night of the vote. And so, you know, I'm looking at how do we make certain we really convey to everybody what we're doing and how we're trying to tackle the deficit and, you know, what we're doing in regards to this current budget and really talk to a narrative and celebrate. And you know, in addition, make certain that we leverage all communication to get folks to join informational meetings mm -hmm. because, you know, we've got to utilize all different ways of communication to make certain we have informed voters. I mean, I can say that that's the biggest difference I think that we're finding as an SU around adjusting to in-person votes where you can educate and inform on the floor and have folks ask their question versus you have an informational meeting prior. And the great thing with democracy is I think more folks are gonna get on the vote, but it now is on us to make certain we've really informed them. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I think that that can be the challenge sometimes. And so that's something new for you guys to have to navigate. 
So, Jamie, you mentioned it was Bethel, the town of Bethel, that needed the information by the 8th of January, but I think that was Royalton that wanted it that early. But maybe it was both. Just for, Royalton yeah, was the 14th. Just for clarification, it was yeah. Royalton that Royalton was the 14th. Started. Uh, Lisa, I got a call from Bethel weeks ago. I see. Okay. Okay. So for both towns, it's it's early. Yeah, I would like for us to do one single publication. It seems like that yeah. deadline will be too much um, or too fast for either community at this point in time. Um, so what I was going to say initially is that I would like one communication to go out to both communities um, with just the really comprehensive and clear reports that we've been working on generating. Um, I think we yeah. should put something in the town report saying that there will be something coming later, just so people don't look for it and miss it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree. The cost for the budget mailer for the Bethel side last year was about $2,300. Yeah. Um, I remembered from Previously, I think it, it's a little over four if we do mailers to both communities, typically. Um, and we don't have anything in the budget currently. Or would this just be a miscellaneous well, item? Is there a line for board trainings, et cetera, miscellaneous? Wasn't that in there? It's a few thousand dollars. Um, in the past, and I think because of COVID, we haven't done like we didn't go to the usual. You have um, an advertising budget, and you also have a dues and fees budget. Is set from potential? What's that? You have a some. You have some funds in your advertising budget, and then you also have funds in your dues and fees line item under the board. Would that cover it? I don't think you've done a lot of advertising. I need to go back and pull where you're at, but between the two line items, there's about $11,000 there. Yeah. I okay. can double check that for you and let you know. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't making a decision to send a mailer and we didn't know where the money would come from. Um, we could okay. get the money from the uh, high school principal salary. <laughs> <laughs> Give so it a uh... Okay, thank you. Um, okay. All right. Um, so, so that's our update on Australian ballot. Um, any questions about that? All right. Next, well, we have. Uh, sorry. Yeah, go for it, Chris. Sorry. I guess just in addition to like a mailing or something, I don't know if we should have something in the paper or ask the paper to write an article about it or or something just to let people know that, that it's going to be different this year. Uh, and then I don't know, too, if, I mean, are we going to host any type of, I don't, we, you know, the, the attendance of this is varies from month to month, but are we going to plan on hosting any sort of virtual info sessions and things like that? Or are we going to record something that we can, you know, post to YouTube or something that people can watch or? Yeah. We've gotten pretty good at this. I mean, so I think all of the above, Chris, just because Tumridge and Chelsea voted three times and Rochester and Stockbridge had to vote twice this way. Um, so I would say all of the above. We'll do these. I think that, you know, we should offer a couple informational meetings this way is lesson learned as well as videotaping and pushing those out um, as well as uh, some boards have chosen to have part of their presentation be um, a YouTube video. And we've been able to share that out via uh, social media. And that was well received. Um, the board did a presentation via YouTube ahead of time um, and used it as part of their informational meeting. But then we also could push that video out and put it on your website and things. I think Front Porch Forum is going to be really important as well. Mm -hmm. When do we have to get it out by? I mean, we have statutory limits for when it has to go. When is that? Um, we really should have it all warned and prepared um, to a top at the end of January. And then we got to get that information out. Tara, what is it, within 30 days? I'm on That's leave. Good, I believe it's only 10 days prior, but we try to get it out 30 days. 
Does it make sense in any way to have um, some of those timelines line up with when um, people's petitions have to be in since everything will be by Australian ballot and we have um, board positions um, or, you know, open and they'll need to be on the ballot as well. Then I wonder if it's an opportunity for us to also um, have those petitions for our candidates in ahead of time and have the candidates provide a statement. Just, I, I mean, if we have a candidate pool, <laughs> which would be my hope, um, I think it would be great for us to be able to share a little information about that just because everything will be by Australian ballot this year. So yeah, what we'll do is get you to approve the budget right and the night that we know we're moving toward approving the budget um then we'll also be seeking to see whether or not those candidates are available and what we will do i said we're going to need a special meeting because of this is mm -hmm. you'll need to approve the ballot as well okay yep. um, and we'll have the ballot all drawn up for you um, and reviewed by legal and then you approve the budget and the ballot awesome in the warning, of course, of course. Of course. So, and we're aiming for early February for that. I really like to have it wrapped up by the end of January. Okay. So we'll plan for two meetings in January. Yeah, and just so you know, as far as the mailing go, Andrew, the we're starting our stuff already. And so the principals have a deadline of January 15th to get their letter done. Um, you know, we'll, Tara and I are working on, you know, the business office side, as you see it, as it's coming out. And like I said, I want to also have this one pager. Um, and uh, my assumption is that the board will have a report, a letter as part of that mailing. We have not started ours yet. Okay. And so the deadlines I was going to give everyone was by, you know, January 15th. And you may have some things you have to based on what's approved, but overall that a lot of the material can be yeah. I break up there that most of the materials be already taken. Wonderful. I don't know about all you. That's what I plan on doing over my holiday break is working on these documents. That makes sense. Yeah. We'll work on the board report then too. Okay. Um, our next item is the Winooski Valley School Choice or Winooski Valley Partnership Agreement. Um, so can you remind us, please, Jamie, the, the number, this is the one where there's sort of a rule that you can ex set your number of students you'll um, allow to go to other schools um, at the 9 through 12 level only, um, but you can only accept the number that you agree to um, sort of let out, right? That's correct. And I think based on percentages and or minimum amount. Mm -hmm. And so last year you guys did uh, no more than 10 students um, on both ends. Okay, mm -hmm. so no more than 10 students in and 10 students out. Yep. You talk to Reed, just so you know, currently right now you have four in, none of them are 12th mm -hmm. graders, and six are out, and four were 12th graders. Yeah. And those folks that have spots already are guaranteed spots. Yeah. Remember that ADM stays with the home school. Right. And no money changes hands. Um, and so I talked to Reed. Reed, correct me if I'm wrong, but the recommendation we were going to have was 10 and 10 again. Yeah. Yep. You could consider bringing more in. You're at what you can't, you can't restrict any more than the 10 out just so you know that's the lowest you can go um and if you might want to bring more in the reason for that would be is if you bring more in that's more students in your school and it's a more it's more of an opportunity for students who are in outside communities out of the district um to talk about how great of experience they have and that can sometimes assist with recruitment of other students and so, you know, if there was any recommendation to have, you might want to think to bump in up students into 15 
but right now you're currently at four and like i said you know you don't have any 12th graders so the most you could permit in would be an additional six so you could think about 15 in 10 out but that's up to you no money follows I, I'm an optimist, so I'm open to looking at 15 in and 10 out if we can. I mean, if, if we can do that, my understanding previously had been that it has to match, um, but I don't see why we wouldn't no, it do doesn't. it. It does not have to match. Okay. Um, so I don't see why we wouldn't do 15 in and 10 out. Um, but I'm open to hearing from other voices. I'll make a motion to set the level at 15 in and 10 out. Okay. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Any discussion? Right. Hearing none. Um, all in favor of setting our levels for the Winooski Valley Agreement at 15 students in and a maximum of 10 out, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Um, and that brings All up. All done. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to new hires. Yeah, we need to put a hit on. We have a, we had a couple of new staff hires um, here in the last month that um, I met with both candidates and was very impressed. Uh, one was a custodial position that had been vacated for quite some time that we chose not to replace in the summer uh, due to COVID and the fact that we were caught up on uh, routine maintenance and facilities and cleaning. Um, and then we got through by with subs up until we were able to secure a candidate. Um, and re talked about that candidate earlier. And then um, we were able to finally bring in a support staff person in the high school to fill uh, Parker Oddsley's position because um, he is your tech person at the, well, he's primarily services the Bethel campus um, and Parker was in that parent position prior. And so we were finally able to get that. If you have questions about what that position does, we can speak more specifically, but they do a lot of targeted intervention and support at the high school level. And we were without it for several months. Great, right, thank you. Okay, um, so that brings us to our next public comment. Um, I'll call on people in the order that I see you unmute, and um, and if someone is sharing um, more than once. Um, priority in terms of the order that I'll call on people goes to so, someone who hasn't spoken yet. I just want to make sure that we hear um, as many voices as possible um, this evening. Cass, I saw you unmute first. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tara. This is nice to see you. Um, I cry a lot lately, so if I cry, I'm fine. And please try to hear my message my emotion okay um a preface i can't imagine having your responsibility collectively to make a budget and satisfy uh the needs of the community <clears throat> in terms of financially being responsible and also making sure that we're providing all of the experiences that we want to i can't imagine so I understand that you have to make some tough decisions and I respect that. Um, I'm really concerned about the music department and just a little history. My daughter, I have three children. One of them is in ninth grade and then Henry is in fifth grade in Lincoln. You probably saw earlier, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Lily um, started playing an instrument in fourth grade. She started with the clarinet played for a little over two years. And then Carrie, by herself, I believe, worked her magic and got Lily a bassoon, access to a bassoon. And um, it's her life is music. And 
um, it's been life changing and um, exclusively should be credited to Carrie is in my eyes as a parent. And if I were to identify over her full career so far, K through nine, one teacher that has had the most academic impact on Lily, it's Carrie. And I, when I say academic, I mean that purposefully in this context. And I think that you all do. And I heard you say it a couple of times, how important the music department is and how proud we are in this community. Um, academically, music we know enriches everything. And that's been true for her. Uh, Lily is a teenager, so she has some mental health needs as all teenagers do and music is her medicine. And uh, I also heard a lot of talk tonight about concerns of the mental health needs of our kids. And I think COVID makes that even heavier. And, um, you know, as a mom, there have been times when it's been difficult to usher my kid out the door if she's struggling. And when I think back through, and all my kids are really connected to the adults in their lives, and and um, it's hard to single anyone out. There's a number that I probably could, but when I think about the one who emotionally supported Lily the most and is Lily's touchstone is Shannon. And so between the two of them, as a parent, when I think about who's helping me raise my children when I can't be the best parent I can be because we're all crazy. It's Shannon and Carrie. And Carrie is now split as I understand it. So she's part-time in Bethel and part-time in South Carrollton. Um, and that concerns me. And I've heard a lot of people say that we're not losing any programming in the music department. And my math brain just can't equate it. I can't equate that we could possibly provide the same education that Lily got going through elementary school with one dedicated music teacher in, in Bethel. Um, with Henry now going through elementary school with a halftime music, general music teacher. I just can't, my brain doesn't see it. And I get that there's things that I don't see and that there's an understanding that I don't get, um, but it's concerning. So I want to say that. I don't have enough history as a parent with Mr. Polly. I'm sure he's uh, wonderful. Um, I, so that's why I'm just speaking about the two, just because as a Bethel resident, they've been the most impactful. I just don't think that we can meet the needs of our students this way. I also am concerned, and I've been really vocal with Mr. Canarney and the principals about um, my concern about the mental health and the mental well being of our teachers. And even if on paper this schedule works, I think that it is pushing the limits of the individual humans that are being asked to carry the load and not just the, the load of the schedule, but the emotional load that teachers carry and and love these kids. And um, I know it's not just mine. So I'm here speaking tonight about my family. If you, I mean, we are raising these kids right now <clears throat> and supporting these families in a huge way right now. And um, those two individuals, have specifically impacted my life and my families with my kids. So that's what I wanted to say. I'm concerned. So thank you for letting me be here to say all of that. I do have a question. I understand the fiscal reasons for not hiring a replacement music teacher. And I understand um, I understand that it helps the budget. I'm wondering if there was an educational philosophy supporting that decision um, because I heard, gosh, and I forget who said, um, I know you all are uh, presenting a budget that sh tries to meet all of these needs, the educational needs, 
And I'm wondering if somebody can explain to me the educational philosophy behind the decision to continue to cut the music department. Thank you. I didn't cry. Would have been okay even if you did, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so does anyone want to speak to um, that question that Cass asked um, at the end in terms of educational um, philosophy in, in support of this? I know we've been talking a lot about finding efficiency. Um, I, I think I can, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Owen. And I don't know if it'll be efficient or sufficient, but Cass, thank you. Because there's courage in what you shared as a parent and as uh, a colleague and a community member. <clears throat> and I want to be thoughtful about this. And I have thought a lot about it. And that, you know, I come from a, a, mu a music family. And I sit every morning and have coffee with my wife. And like all of you, these conversations come up. And she'll say to me, like, how can you talk about music like that? And I'm not talking about music. But I'm also talking about um, Lucille Knowles, who I can see her trailer from my house. And I'm asking her because we all pay taxes into one pot in Vermont, I'm asking her to pay more every year in her taxes to support everything we do. I pay taxes in, in Bethel because now we all pay taxes in one place. I'm really proud of the music I've supported in uh, as a school principal in all of the schools I've been in because it's all it seems to me it's always on like the table of like all right let's look at where the edges are so we're not going to cut this we'll cut that but it's and we can easily say it's the arts but it's not just the arts it's all of the specials and the essentials and you're safe because you're a math teacher and and I know what the words I'm using, by the way. And one of the things we talked about today was like, where are the increases and decreases? And are there increases in administration? Are there decreases in, in instruction? And are there increases in operation or maintenance? We look at all of it, a $12 million budget that, that Bob Gray pointed out. And a million dollars a month is what that comes out to. I, I take my responsibility as an administrator of, like, of weighing all that so seriously. And I know you know me, and I'm like, I don't, I don't talk about things lightly like this. And I personally, love Shannon, Josh, and Carrie. And I know your daughter. So not well, but I know her and I see her with her big instrument that I don't understand and her teachers are helping her understand. I feel like we can meet, we can more than meet her need to, to make that instrument part of our life. And this is not anything about Carrie or, or Shannon or Josh or your daughter. It's about figuring out how to weigh Lucille Knowles's tax burden and my responsibility to offer the best possible program to your daughter. And I'm not like playing with words or being silly. I'm being serious. And I don't, I didn't know why you wanted to come to the meeting tonight. And I'm really happy you came and you asked this hard question. And I don't know if I'll have the right answer or not. But I have to put in front of me like the thing about like, 
I have to make sure all the students have access to literacy and numeracy and all the other things. And I'll tell you that music happens in my house more than we do math problems. Sorry, Kat. Or more than we like analyze literature, but, and also, I feel I'm really proud of what we offer. My brother-in-law is a music teacher, a public school music teacher. <clears throat> and I know that his job has been put on the table. And I have, not this year, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner with him. And I know that that's real. But it's not about his job. And it's not about my job. It's about our job of making sure our Vermont children, and in this case, our White River Unified District children have the best program. And I, I know some people in Bethel and South Royalton that have white hair and tax burden. And I want to help them too. So you know my burden. And we've talked about this. I know we have. Somebody's coming in, and I could use help because I don't know all of this. All but right, I, thank you. I'll, thank you, Owen. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Owen. Jamie raised a hand, um, and I appreciate um, you jumping in to comment. So thank you. So, Cass, I'll just say, too, that you know, I think as we are building the budgets this year, we're making certain that we're prioritizing creating a comprehensive system of supports improving personalized learning and pathways, those, those two overarching goals, while also trying to maintain programming at the best we can, right? Like at those levels that we absolutely can. So yes, we're choosing not to increase the music position, but we did add a pathway coordinator that I think our high school students have needed for a really long time. And so there wasn't all just cuts in this budget. We did look at, we increased math intervention and so we did look at also where could we add? And so the, you know, the priorities that we tried to do is where are we lacking currently right now? And where can we find efficiencies? And frankly, we looked at two of what management decisions could we make because we have such great educators in here. I said to principals, I, I'm not interested in losing the folks we have. And so some of the decisions we made around foreign language and music also had to do with the fact of that we're not having reduction in force in other areas right now. And we felt like if we could meet the needs of the district without replacing, but find efficiencies there, that that made good sense. And so that certainly played into our decision-making as well. I don't want to. No, I do have more. I do have more, but if somebody else wants to speak, let me. We were getting some echo. Um, what you just shared, Cass, was distorted, and so I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. Yes, I don't mean to jump back in. So if there's somebody else that wants to speak, I can wait my turn. But I do have more to say. Is all I wanted. To. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else. Oh, Tanya, would you like? like to jump in yeah. yes please. thank you um i just want to have you guys keep in mind that um i don't want students to miss out um on an opportunity that is touch my son tanner he's he's in ninth grade now and um with music i would be as old um I'm not, I don't even know the word. Um, he, he's just, he was a very quiet, very withdrawn child. And with doing the ensemble, the music ensemble for the boys, completely changed him around. He'll talk to people now, um, whereas before he would kind of hide behind me when he was younger. And he's been doing it since I think the fourth or fifth grade. And I honestly was hoping that Sierra was gonna be able to do the girls ensemble to help her out as well. Um, and I just want to make sure that every student has that same opportunity to be able to um, to bring their, um, yep, I'm sorry, I'm going through that phase of not remembering words, um, 
that opportunity of having their uh, self-esteem brought up by something that is so important to them. And this was important to Tanner and Mrs. B obviously helped that. Um, but I just, I want every student to be able to do that because Tanner wasn't good, great in, 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 you know, in sports and he's not great in school doing schoolwork. So by him going to music and having that opportunity to show himself and to feel like he's actually accomplished something and doing well in something and being told, you know, by even the people that have gone to the concerts that he did well was amazing to me. And I just, I want to see that be available to all students. That's all I guess I, I have to say. Thank you, Tanya. Um, any other um, public to share um, this evening? Okay. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I know you guys all know this, but the, our concerts in Bethel are the number one attended community event, period. And it's so it's not just the school members that um, the community of, in the school that benefits from that. It's a huge event in our town. <clears throat> and I'm sure it's a huge event in South Royalton. And so, it, and that's not by accident. It was, it's been building. I've seen it every year get bigger. And uh, Tanya spoke about the boys ensemble. <sighs> Henry would love to join the boys ensemble and I think about boys in particular who aren't necessarily maybe a comfortable or confident pursuing music so to have that opportunity and now to take that away feels like such a missed opportunity to really feed a program in the middle and high school levels uh, if we are not addressing or filling those gaps or those needs at the elementary, we're going to see a dip in student participation when they get to middle and high school. And I'm concerned about that. Henry in fourth grade was really looking forward to starting a, an instrument. Now we don't do that. Andrew, I appreciate you spoke to a potential solution for now that Henry's in fifth grade, because again, it was sort of taken away from him. So at every level, I just keep seeing him not get the same opportunities that Lily got. And that's just a fact. And it's, um, th those are just a few examples of the literal specific actual ways that I'm seeing a difference and I'm seeing a decline that I'm concerned about. So that's all. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would second that, the, you know, like, before we used to start instrument or the kids used to start instruments in fourth grade and we changed that two or three years ago so that it was starting in fifth grade and in fourth grade they were doing recorders to kind of get used to doing ensemble stuff you know i i'm not necessarily saying you know anything as far as the staffing levels but it would be good to i think it would be good to think creatively about ways that we could support parents you know parents can go and get instruments and do private lessons that they want but i think speaking from my personal experience i don't really know like when is appropriate for kids to do that sort of stuff and i don't have the you know you, you kind of when you're parenting you have a lot of you know uh inertia where you you're doing your day-to-day -day thing and you don't really think oh now's the time to go get the kid an instrument and have them start playing you know like it's hard to know when to do that stuff and so if there was something where you had presented resources where you could help parents like if we're not going to do it in school help parents who are interested in doing more for their kids you know connect them with private lessons to get them started a little bit earlier or whatever that might be something we could do to help i don't know just a thought and yes i do think that we should definitely do that for the fifth graders this year because <laughs> You know, otherwise we're going to have them going into sixth grade with no, you know, the starting from ground zero with band, which is, you know, seems problematic. I will say one of the things that has made it so that our choral music has stood out is that we do have boys who sing. And I think those late elementary school and middle level boys ensembles 
um, have set our program apart um, because I know that high schools struggle to have boys involved in chorus. Um, and so that's something that, that has been remarkable and has been really positive. Lisa, could I say something? Absolutely, Bob. Okay. Um, I was in high school in 1966 when I, gra I graduated. So I started taking trumpet le lessons from Dick Ellis, um, I think, uh, in the eighth grade. Dick Ellis was a music teacher in South Royalton, Chelsea, Bethel, and Randolph all at the same time. And he taught all of us to play individual lessons. And he, each one of those towns had a band. And we had exchange concerts during the year. Um, I had a, <laughs> I had a tremendous music experience. I'm not even a musician. Um, but Dick Ellis provided a great experience for me and all of the kids. I played in a band of 45 kids in South Royalton. Um, and I, I hear everyone talk, but I think about what that man did. And I don't understand. I, I'd like to see our music teachers doing, a, doing some of that same stuff, but I understand the music program is important. Having been a principal, I support the arts, um, music, art, drama. Um, I support it all because it's a part of what the kids need. Um, so I just, I just want to say that I had a really good music experience. Dick Ellis was my teacher. He did a great job, but he also was a teacher of a lot of kids in the in the district. So, you know, I, I understand what people are saying, but I know that with three music teachers, we, we should be able to provide an experience for all those kids. Um, I'm wondering, I, I can understand the interest in music and how it can really nurture and support um, different types of students. And uh, and obviously the limitations with COVID to meet in groups, uh, you know, but there's got to be there's there's got to be some ways virtually that we can expose students to um, other ways of learning music um, on a virtual level or even in group gatherings meeting virtually. There's got to be some examples that are just starting to develop and evolve it almost seems like there's opportunities to add music on a higher level um, by having teachers be in more places than, you know, at the same time or in more households at the same time, if we can work on some creative ways to do that. I'm just curious what the thoughts are around, around that or what's been happening already. I'm not sure if I made sense, but it made sense to me. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, I would say that that's absolutely in alignment. I think your three music teachers are working hard to do that. Um, and I wrote down notes to talk to the principal to follow up with this fifth grade instrumental concern that I heard and see how we can get to the bottom of that. But, you know, I think absolutely the music teachers have been working incredibly hard to reach out and you know think outside the box and i think you know i'm hearing about our band playing up on the green and and just i know that all three of them are working incredibly hard to do what you just said um and that's part of the the type of thing i think we're going to need to continue to use um and you know instrumental lessons are really important and it's it's been a real value um across both these towns for a long time and you know bob talked about dick and i think you know, Dick really influenced that, uh, Mr. Ellis. And, uh, you know, 
So know that those are absolutely the types of things that we're talking about when we say we got to just, we're looking at it differently. I'm not, I have no interest, and I said this back in the spring, to decrease offerings for our kids, right? Like to, to limit what they can be exposed to with the performing arts because it's just an incredible thing and it's, it's really important. So um, know that, that certainly I feel that way. I think one of the sort of philosophical rifts that I've seen um, sort of fester is um, this idea of like excellence in terms of music versus music being something that's accessible for everybody. Um, and I've seen that bubble up at various times um, in, in these conversations. And I think that, um, my hope is that we get to a place where music is accessible for everybody and we're we're um moving in that direction of being really proud of the the quality of music that's being produced and i think that's what people are concerned about um in terms of elementary school offerings and and not having those ensembles that have meant so much to people throughout the years um i don't know that was just one perspective that I had. I know there are other people who've joined, some who've joined by phone over the course of the evening. Um, and please feel free to press star six if you want to unmute and share. Um, okay, well, we are, open to email and feedback and I appreciate people um, sharing their thoughts about this as we continue to work through the budget and thinking about um, how things will look as we return to a more normal school year hopefully next year. Um, hopefully. I have a lot of hope for these vaccines and everything that's happening right now. All right, so that brings us to other. Um, and is there any other for us to discuss right now? Okay. Our next regular meeting um, in the agenda is January 19th. However, I think we'll probably meet um, either before or after that and fit yeah, in. Yeah, stay tuned. I'll send out a uh, board correspondence about getting a special. Okay. Uh, earlier than that, uh, just for budget. Okay. And also to set the tuition rate. Right. right. Thank you, Tara. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, so I think we're at that point where I could um, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Thank you all um, very much. Yeah, Chris, are you seconding that motion? Second, yes. All right, thank you. Um, and we'll adjourn at 843. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the holidays. Um, if anyone's on who's celebrating Hanukkah, thank you um, for giving up your evening to be here.